All right, welcome to lecture number four on sensors and signal conditioning. So let's talk about ultrasonic transducers and microsensors in today's lecture. Now, ultrasonic transducers actually work on the principle of ultrasound, that is, it's a band of frequencies, it's above the range of 20 kilohertz, which is actually above the sonic range that human can actually hear. Sensors that are based on this principle can transmit this ultrasound or they can actually receive this ultrasound wave. And these changes in the variable are actually determined by measuring the changes in the time taken for the ultrasonic wave to travel between transmitter and the receiver. And the most common form of ultrasonic element actually is the piezoelectric crystal. So the principle is to use a piezoelectric crystal for example, if you see on this side, so a piezoelectric crystal actually can vibrate if we apply a voltage across its ends. And if we make it, uh, you know, vibrate, we can make it vibrate as per the frequency of the input signal. So the moment it vibrates, it creates some waves in the form of sound waves and anything beyond vibrating it beyond 20 kilohertz actually would lead to the, the production of ultrasound or you can say ultrasonic waves. Now these waves propagate in air, they propagate in different medias. So this is more about transmission where we are actually converting the electric energy into the mechanical energy. And these also act as receivers where we have the same or can say similar piezoelectric material and it outputs a voltage as per the sound waves that it receives. So these sound waves or mechanical waves actually try to deform this piezoelectric material and accordingly it produces an output. So, so all these uh, ultrasounds or you can say ultrasonic transducers mainly employ piezoelectric materials, uh, I can say piezoelectric crystals actually as their basic, uh, basic you can say component. Now uh, they obviously convert this electric energy which is in the form of excitation into the ultrasound or you can say mechanical energy in the form of sound or sound waves and in the, in the, in the receiver end these sound waves or you can say these mechanical this mechanical energy is converted back to electrical energy which can be measured or displayed or used for some control purposes. Now obviously they, they use um, typically piezoelectric materials so the piezoelectric effect is being used which, which uses voltage to deform and generate the acoustic waves. This is a, a small uh, let's say a picture of an ultrasound ultrasonic transducer, typical ultrasonic transducer which contains a piezoelectric ceramic at the bay, at the center and then there is a stacked bolt already there and then there are openings whereby uh, we can, can actually use this as a transmitter and also as a receiver. Now uh, if you want to calculate the distance between an object and the sensor now which is one of the prime motives of the ultrasonic transducers so if the distance between the sensor or you can say transmitter receiver and the object is let's say L0. So this is given by an equation of this form Vt cos phi by 2 where T is the time taken for the ultrasonic waves to travel to the object and back to the receiver. So transmitter is one where we have a piezoelectric crystal which is being uh, excited by an electric signal. It generates sound waves. They move to the object and from the object they are reflected back and the receiver is again a crystal which receives these sound waves or mechanical waves and converts them to the electric energy. So the time taken from the transmitter to the receiver, this time taken for the waves to leave from transmitter and to reach to the receiver is T. So we do T by 2 because we have to just calculate the distance which is half of the total distance traveled which will be 2 L0. So we will have L is equal to T by 2 that is traveled in half of the time into the velocity. So the V is the velocity of sound in let's say the media in which it travels typically air but it can be any other 
medium in the form of water in the form of other let's say objects that we use these ultrasounds for and cos phi here is actually the angle this is the cos this is the phi so as we move the the, the transmitter and receiver close enough so the angle reduces to almost zero where cos phi reduced to almost one so it's a very simple relation vt by two so knowing the speed of uh, the ultrasound or can say sound waves in air and uh, knowing the time taken from the uh, transmitter to the receiver we can actually calculate the distance between the object and the sensor which is the one of the most important can say one of the prime important you know application of the ultrasounds now this this curve here on this right side it talks about the uh, piezoelectric material uh, and its properties like sensitivity of the piezoelectric material and also the the impedance of the piezoelectric material so obviously piezoelectric material is a crystal you can say it has some obviously it will have some resonance because you can model this if it vibrates as per the electric signal so it will be modeled in the form of some let's say it could be spring mass damper model it will have some natural frequency okay so so that it could have it will have some obviously this natural frequency can match to the frequency of excitation so we'll have resonance so at resonance we have the maximum sensitivity for these materials and we have the least impedance and this is where generally we we desire you know to to actually use these piezoelectric crystals for as the ultrasonic sensors now uh, again a similar pattern how they were actually put up so this is the input voltage for the uh, for the for this uh, ultra for the piezoelectric element to act as the uh, transmitter and this is as the receiver where output voltage is taken up so it's like more of a piezoelectric ceramic element that is used here it flexes and transmits the out ultrasonic waves and uh, obviously it can generate voltage when the incoming waves flex the material in this in this in this b case uh, the typical frequency uh, that is used in trans <coughs> in the ultrasound, I can say transmitting these electric elements is 32 kilohertz. Though we can use any frequency above this also, and as as we have already discussed that for better efficiency, frequency of the driving oscillator, or you can say the driving this one, the oscillator, or you can say the voltage input should be adjusted to the resonant frequency of the piezoelectric ceramic material because it will have the maximum can say sensitivity and efficiency of the element is best at this in that case this is an example of a transducer ultrasonic transducer for operation in air where you let the air you can say we let the sound waves you know, go directly into this uh, radial cone type you know shape is produced here so that the 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 waves are converged and then there is a piezoelectric there's a diaphragm here and then there's a piezoelectric ceramic material so it will actually pick up and it will also it can act as both transmitter and as well as receiver there are lead terminals now uh, the topologies for this could be that we generally can you know use them as in the form of pulse echo sensor module or we can also use them in the transmit receive sensor modules or you can see topology where the piezoelectric crystal actually since it generates the voltage and force is applied and and it also actually you know it vibrates as we apply some voltage to it so it can act as both uh, the transmitter and the receiver also so the, in the first case when the circuit actually operates in the pulsed echo mode the same piezoelectric element can be used for both transmission and the reception in which we we let the in in one cycle let's say of operation we let the uh, transmitter to operate so it transmits the waves and uh, in the other cycle we let it to actually receive the the waves so this can be you know one of the topologies so when there uh, is a requirement of something called as continuous transmission of the ultrasonic waves then these uh, we can use separate uh, you know elements for both the transmitter and the receiver this is how it acts then you have transmitter that transmits the signals the sound waves to the target and then they are reflected to the receiver so we can have separate transmitter and receiver and these are the two topologies now uh, this is some kind of a uh, system level block diagram how actually they operate so you have uh, this is more about electronics part of it so you have a control unit you have a communication interface a pulse generator that is you know put up in the ultrasonic transducer driver 
and then it, it, it drives the, the transducer as per the frequency that we want it to operate at and then it emits the ultrasound waves. Similarly, uh, we can use something called edge bridge here, which actually acts as switch for us. You can say solid, solid state switch uh, because we need high frequency switching. And similarly, in the receiver end, we need there may be noise associated. There may be requirements of filter to have actually this received signal to be filtered out. And there may be an amplification again required for the same signal. Then we have something called as ADC, which is analog to digital conversion. Then we have digital signal processing. We calculate the time of flight that is required in the in, in the equation uh, L naught is equal to Vt by 2 cos phi. So this time of flight is to be calculated. This we know. And then we can actually evaluate the distance between the object and the sensor. Now the applications are profound. You have medical imaging. You have very popularly called ultrasound that we generally use in medical imaging. And this is one of the one of the significant uh, application of the ultrasonic uh, sensors. Then we have in industries non-destructive testing. We detect internal flaws within the components without even you know, going for destructive testing. We have surface type detection. We have in the in the in the fluids we can do something called as liquid level control or level measurements. And then we have uh, in robots, we use them for obstacle level avoidance. We use them to you know, find out the translation displacements. We can use them in car parking system. You may have seen in the, you know, in the back towards the back of the car, you have these ultrasonic sensors installed, which detect the distance between the, the, uh, the car and or you can say bumper and the, and the wall. So which is a quite, you know, one of the quite, you know, I can say good sensors that we use in our day to day life. We use it in 3D motion tracking. We can use them in flow and temperature measurements also. And we generally have a you know, contemporary application in the form of personal fitness devices and fingerprint sensors. And wind speed and direction also can be measured with these sensors. So this is a typical image of a hospital where we take you know, ultrasound of a patient. And it actually tells us about you know, the, the advantages and the, the contemporary application of this ultrasonic sensors being used actually in the hospitals you know ubiquitously and uh, how it is done actually just a short glimpse of it so we have a short burst of ultrasonic energy this is transmitted from the ultrasonic element to the medium medium being investigated in this case the human body where you want to actually find out the you know problems with the internal organs so uh, you can actually use uh, ultrasonic you know uh, you can short burst ultrasonic energies actually transmitted and then uh, we have a frequency range of 1 megahertz to 15 megahertz that's used in this type of ultrasonic imaging. So it is reflected in all the interfaces between different materials. So you have different materials within the human body in the form of kidneys, in the form of other internal organs which have their own specific properties in terms of density and in terms of other properties. So accordingly, the, the proportion of energy that is reflected is dependent on the material actually you know, that it actually hits. Now the principal components inside a human body are, are actually water, fat, muscle, bones, and the interfaces between each of these have different reflectance characteristics. So this is how a typical ultrasonic transducer is put up here in the form of a probe. And we use something called as a coupling gel. And then there are different you know, subcutaneous fat, abdominal muscles, and then different you know, muscle fat, fat muscle, and we have different reflective, you can say reflectance characteristics. And accordingly, different waves are actually reflected from which can be picked up by the ultrasonic transducer. Now, obviously, the, in this case, again, we have measurement of time between energy transmission and received of the reflected signal, which gives us the depth of the interface. And the, the reflected energy appears as a series of peaks. So in this case, if you see, this is the transducer, this is the water, this is the skin surface, these are the internal organs. And accordingly, if you have the you know, voltage output in terms of time, you can see with respect to time, so you have transmitted pulse is given in this form. And this is echo received from the skin surface. And this is the type of profile that we see. Echo received from the organ front face, echo received from the organ back face. So you, you we, we, we send a you know, ultrasonic wave from here. And accordingly, we get some, you know, you know, this is kind of an input wave. And accordingly, we get something from, you know, from here. So accordingly, it hits the organs again, it goes through the, some part of it goes to, to the organs. Again, it's reflected back. Some part again moves from the organs to the back of the organ. Again, it's reflected back. 
So you have different, you know, parts of this ultrasonic, you know, waves that travel, you know, beneath the, you can say that travel through the skin surface, that travel through the organs, that, you know, a part of them are reflected. And accordingly, we can find from these, you know, different curves or from these different actually voltage levels, we can determine the the kind of you know, organs or can can say the, the the kind of problems that are associated internally. So these are typical uh, commercial uh, you know, uh, application in terms of ultrasonic probes that are used. Some displays that gives us you know easy understanding of the problems in the internal organs. It's a typical setup of an ultrasonic uh, you know measurements of human um, human um, body. Then we have non-destructive testing. Uh, which is uh, popularly referred to as NDT. So in this case, you may see an example whereby we put this transducer inside a, a component or a plate where there's a crack. So rather than actually, you know, uh, looking for a destructive testing method, we use this type of non-destructive method in which the ultrasonic waves actually travel through this plate and they are reflected. But at the crack, because it is a discontinuity, so we will have ultrasonic waves traveling, you know, halfway through. So something like this, we get an initial pulse, then we get a crack echo, and then back surface echo, which we receive from the back of the plate. So this actually tells us that there is something problem associated with with the with this component. And if there was no crack, so we would have got something like this. So this was the initial pulse, then we had just have the back surface echo that we received. So there was nothing as crack echo here. So that would actually differentiate between the crack and being having no crack. Similarly, you have surface type detection. You can put this ultrasound you know, on a soft carpet, a firm carpet, a low pile carpet, hardwood and tile. For tile, you will see there's a big amplitude that we get from the, you know, as an output of the ultrasound. And for, for the soft carpet, because it actually absorbs the ultrasound, ultrasonic waves, so the reflected wave is actually too poor. So obviously the level, the amplitude level is actually very low. But in the in case of tile, the reflection is quite high, so we can determine you know, different surfaces from these type of profiles also. Now we have an, an example of an ultrasonic flow meter, where we actually try to measure the flow uh, associated with the you know liquids. So we have uh, let's say supply of you can say you know supply of different liquids or you can say in the form of water in the form of let's say you know different substances that can be supplied in the form of oil. So what we can do is we can put two ultrasonic sensors here in the form of transmitter and the receiver, and an arrangement arrangement can be put in this form. And as it travels through this you know uh, medium, which is actually water or it can be any other you know uh, fluid. And accordingly, uh, we can actually find out the time it takes for the transmitter signal to reach to the receiver end. So as the velocity of the liquid increases, so or it decreases accordingly, the time taken would also change. So this is the typical line diagram of this type of a sensor. So we have a transmitted pulse, we have a received pulse. Sometimes for an upstream, we may see an, you know, a shift in the, or can say phase shift in the, in the signal. Or in the downstream, we may see a phase, you know, a phase lag in the in the transmitted signal, and this is how it looks like. We have a different receiver. You have a transmitter, you know, associated with this type of uh, sensors. So a receiver, transmitter, and clock that controls this transmission and you know, reception. All right. So now uh, moving to acoustic thermometer. So we have. Uh, you know, temperature measurement also as an application. So, for example, we have a chamber which has a very high temperature of something called as cryogenic temperatures, which are very high temperatures, which we cannot just you know measure by any simple instruments. So, where we want to avoid actually also contact with the instrument, so we can use something called an you know, acoustic thermometer, which is actually based on the principle of ultrasonic uh, ultrasound, ultrasound, where we actually have again a transmitter, a receiver, and a clock that controls this transmission and receiving end or that measures the time taken and have a controller. So what happens is, again, a piezoelectric material is used here as a transmitter. So it generates sound waves that travel through this in the form of dry air, sorry, that travel through that dry air and are received at the at this end, which are converted back to the in a voltage in the form of electric signals. Now, uh, what happens is as the temperature increases, uh, this, this, uh, this uh, tube or you can say this pipe that is enclosed here for the measurements 
and the temperature of the air increases. So we have a relation with the velocity of you know sound in air, which also varies with temperature of the air like this. So as the temperature of air increases, so the velocity in the <coughs> sorry the velocity in this medium actually will increase. So accordingly, we can uh, determine the the uh, the temperature of this because we know the change in the velocity and uh, we we know the time taken so we can find out <coughs> the temperature with this relation so this acts as a thermometer <coughs> sorry we can use them <coughs> for tracking 3d object motion where we can uh, have an object placed at t which which has a uh, ultrasonic uh, transmitter attached so as the object moves so it, it transmits the ultrasonic waves so we can have ultrasonic receivers at three points let's say in this case at a b and c points for example and then as the ultrasonic waves are transmitted here they receive and accordingly we can actually find out the the dist distance a b and c because uh, we we know uh, that uh, the the x component would be given by a square q square minus b square by 2q Accordingly, we can know this, these distances P, Q, and A, B, and C. We can find out because we know from this relation again, we can find out the time taken F or you know, it to reach to C, time taken to reach to A, to reach to B because velocity is constant. So we can find out different A, B, and C accordingly, and they can be substituted here to find out the X, Y, Z location of this object. Now we have an uh, let's say advanced technology called CMUTs, which is capacitive micro machine ultrasonic transducers. This is uh, just an additional information on this. We can have ultrasonic uh, transducers which are actually capacitive based rather than piezoelectric based because we have seen till now most of the ultrasonic you know, sensors use piezoelectric materials or you can see piezoelectric crystals. But we may have uh, something called as a very advanced technology called as CMUTs. Is capacitive micro machine ultrasonic transducers. It's relatively a new field, and uh, the energy transduction in this case is due to, due to the capacitance. So they are now they are more of MEMS based. CMUTs are more of MEMS based, where it's constructed on silicon using micro machining techniques. So you you form a you form a cavity in the silicon substrate, and a thin layer is suspended at the top of the cavity, which serves as a membrane on which a metallic layer acts as an elect electrode together with the silicon substrate which serves as a bottom electrode so again in this case an ac signal is applied across the biased electrode it will generate ultrasonic waves in the medium of interest so it works as a transmitter on the other hand if we apply uh, you know some uh, let's say waves on the membrane it will generate some alternating signal which will in this work in, in this way it will act as a receiver also so obviously in the range of 30 kilohertz to 3 kilohertz we can have the resonant frequency of these elements. Now they look like something this in this form. So we have a membrane. It's all at the MEMS level. You an output signal. If we if we put some ultrasonic waves on these membranes, it will you know vibrate, and accordingly the distance between the two these uh, uh, will change as accordingly the capacitance also changes, which can be measured as an in the form of an output signal. So this is how it looks like. This is the 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 the, the array, and then you, it's all you know, embedded. I can say on the silicon, and you have integrated circuit for processing these signals, all put up on the silicon wafer. And this is how they are put up. CMUT transducer arrays are put up on these ultrasound probes, which are you know very you know very contemporary in nature. Now coming to the advantages of ultrasonic sensors. Uh, so since they propagate with the speed of sound, which is much lower than the speed of light, at which the microwaves propagate, so the time taken is much longer, and hence the measurement can be easier and cheaper than the microwaves one because they operate at the speed of light. So again, uh, they act you know, as an alternative to the photoelectric sensors in which we use you know, these for distance measurements. But when we have a clear object detection or for liquid level measurements where photoelectric sensors actually do not work. So uh, ultrasonic sensors you know, are quite handy at that place. So in this case, again, target color or reflectivity it will not matter because they can operate in high, any, you know, reliably in high glare environments also. Uh, ultrasonic materials detect a lot of you know, variety of materials regardless of their shape, transparency, or color, the only requirement is that the material should be solid or liquid. 
So ultrasonic sensors do not generally, you know, uh, uh, do not generally measure the gases in this case. So we have only solids and liquids for in which there is a you know, reflection of the ultrasonic waves. For gases, we don't use ultrasonic sensors. That's their limitation. So obviously they are contactors de detection because we, we don't have need to you know, really make them in contact with the object for which we need to, need to find the distance you know, from the object. But in some cases we may even have contact based sensing like probes in the in the ultrasound you know medical imaging. So we can have a contact based also but in the obstacle avoidance and other applications they, they are morely you know counted as contactless detection methods. So obviously in the non-destructive testing we require high frequency and high sensitivity, high penetrating power and it can easily detect the deep objects and the cracks in them. The limitations again are quite few. So since they operate on the principle of sound, uh, the ultrasound, so obviously any background noise in the noise in the industries or the manufacturing operation that is typical of the industrial environments, they can actually you know interfere with the, the with these uh, ultrasonic you know, uh, you know these you know sensor uh, signals because uh, if if it it's if, if it's really you know of that you know, frequency then it will be a problem otherwise if it's not of that frequency of at which the ultrasonic sensors work then it really doesn't matter but generally it has been found that there are some cases in which the environment noise of wide frequency can affect the operation of these sensors the uh, signal levels of these measurements are generally low and therefore they are prone to contamination by electromagnetic noise. So you need to have some you know, filtering and amplification mechanisms, kind of sensors or sorry, kind of electronic circuits that are to be added to these sensors. The applicable frequency is small because we are using piezoelectric materials. So obviously we don't have a large variety of piezoelectric materials where the frequency range is also you know, a point of but a large you know, range availability. Again, we require high driving voltage, voltage generally, so we use pulse transfer, transformer boosts. So this is uh, something that is required as an additional can say, you know, thing to this sensor. So this is called as limitations. Sensitivity is obviously small as we already talked about because of the limited uh, piezoelectric materials that we have. The permeable targets like sponge, foam and soft clothing absorb more of the ultrasonic energy so we don't really get a good output out of these materials. Again this is a limitation transmission medium so ultrasonic waves actually travel at different velocities in different mediums like in air the velocity is 331 meter per second. Obviously in, in, in the in the in other mediums the, the velocity that it travels is it's quite good um, but what happens is these sensors are not actually actually optimized you know to travel through uh, you know any any of the you know media so they are optimized for a particular medium only and the attenuation also happens in in you know as a function of frequency so we see this graph so in, in the liquids and solids we can use transducers of in the low megahertz range for high accuracy applications uh, but for the air we, we are limited to frequencies below kilo 500 kilohertz so you can see uh, at 200 kilohertz, this blue one, so there is a lot of attenuation as we you know, increase the distance between the sensor and the object, you know, hose, you know, this is to be measured, distance to be measured. So as we go on increasing to 500 kilohertz, we may have more attenuation, which is generally undesirable. So uh, something like 20 kilohertz, which was put up here as this is comparatively better in terms of the, the frequency attenuation. And uh, the direction of travel and directionality, the air currents can also alter the direction of travel of ultrasonic sonic waves. And air current actually moving at the velocity of 10 kilometers per hour has been shown experimentally to deflect an ultrasound wave by 8 millimeter over distance of 1 meter. So this is again, again a limitation with, with these ultrasonic waves, can you know, go through this in detail. We have something called as acoustic impedance. So this is defined as the product of density and the acoustic velocity. So we have the mediums or the materials as air, water, muscle, aluminum, iron, steel. So you can see the density is different for each material. And we have the acoustic velocity or you can say velocity of the sound through these different materials as different. And accordingly, we can define something called as acoustic impedance that we you know, achieve for 
different materials. So air has the lowest acoustic impedance. So sound waves have to travel through these various types of mediums to detect objects with significant you know, acoustic impedance mismatch. Now the difference between the two objects is defined as the impedance mismatch. For example, if we see these two uh, examples where we have a skin, air on the right side, air on the left side. So you can see a transducer is emitting an ultrasonic wave, 99% is reflected back. So this is the air skin interface. 1% is you know, going inside the skin. Again, 0.99% will come back at the skin air interface. 0.01 is actually lost. So you can say uh, this is this is something that is generally you can say uh, defined as per this 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 definition, which is actually the reflection coefficient. So obviously, the greater the impedance mismatch, the greater percentage of energy is reflected at the boundary between the two mediums. So there is impedance mismatch between this is air. So there is impedance mismatch between air and skin, and skin and air again. So there is a lot of difference between air and skin. So obviously a lot of energy is actually reflected back and rather in this case where we have water and steel so the difference is lesser so obviously lesser amount of energy which is 88 percent here in this case is reflected 12 percent goes in then again you have almost 88 percent going back and 12 percent going in so this is how you know the ultrasonic waves actually travel because you know there, there is something called as impedance mismatch that we define in this case, so that is this Z2 minus Z1 by Z2 plus Z1 whole square. So this is the reflection coefficient that we use as a function of the impedance between the objects. Now we have an important factor called as radar cross section. So in this case, if we see then uh, the transmitter receiver is like this in the pulse echo mode kind of you know, arrangement. So if we have a flat surface, we have almost 100% of the reflected energy going back to the transmitter. But if we have a round target, so we'll see a lot of energy is actually getting waste in, and that's not being transmitted back to the transmitter. So the percentage of transmission or you can say reception is less. And if, if you have a tilted target again, a lot of energy actually is wasted. Uh, it's not reflected back to the, uh, to the receiver. So the cross-section, radar cross-section is actually how well the target is able to reflect ultrasonic waves back to the transducer. So Obviously, curved or tilted objects may scatter the majority of ultrasonic waves you know, transmitted towards the object, which provides a weak echo response. So this is again their limitation. The velocity of the air coupled ultrasonic echo is influenced by the external environment par parameters such as temperature, humidity, and the ambient noise. The ambient noise we have already talked about. So the sensing range decreases as the temperature increases. Also, the sensing range you can say rate decreases humidity increases the same often be neglected because the effects are minimal but the debris present in the air like like dust rain or snow can also weaken the ultrasonic energy and alter the field of view of the sensor though now let's come to uh, the micro sensors or the mems these are uh, sensors that again utilize some mechanical or you can say electrical principles but uh, they are given a special class you can say or called as micro sensors because uh, the the fabrication is totally different, the the uh, manufacture is totally different, manufacturing is totally different, and their applications are again profound. Uh, so let's move ahead. So these are millimeter sized, or you can say micrometer sized, you know, uh, three dimensional structures, which obviously are now smaller in size. They have improved performance, but reliability and low production costs than the alternative forms of the sensors. So they are constructed out of generally silicon semiconductor materials. Now they are sometimes fabricated even using metal, plastics, polymers, glasses, and ceramics, which are deposited on a silicon base. So again, if you see this silicon micro accelerometer, so you have a proof mass, you have a silicon layer, glass substrate, etched piezoelectric or piezoresistive element. Now silicon is ideal material for the sensor construction because it has external mechanical properties like the tensile strength and Young's modulus is similar to the steel while the density is less than the aluminum. So it's quite, quite strong and it's quite light. So this is one of the ideal materials for the sensor construction. Now sensors made from this single crystal of silicon actually remain elastic almost to the breaking point and the mechanical hysteresis is very small for the silicon and their 
Thermal ex expansion coefficient is also very low. So they are exposed to the high temperatures and the most gases solvents acid without actually being deteriorated. The fabrication is using microengineering techniques we, in which we use new techniques similar to integrated circuit manufacturing, which, which include crystal growing, polishing, thin film deposition, iron implantation, wet and dry chemical and laser etching and photolithography. So these are some of the popular techniques that are used in the you know, integrated circuit manufacturing that we you know, use called a semiconductor technology where we you know, try to make the integrated circuit on the silicon chip. So these, these, these structures like cantilever beams and these you know, proof mass in case accelerometers or all such devices are actually you know, uh, at, you know, developed on the same wafer. So this is one of the significant advantages with processors. So the applications are for measuring pressure acceleration, you can say force, chemical parameters, so mechanical microsensors transform obviously the measured variables such as force, pressure and acceleration into displacement and the displacement is measured using capacitive or piezoresistive techniques in which you have seen in the first slide of the microsensor that we use piezoresistive or can say capacitive you know, measurements can be done where the you know movement can be you know correlated to the change in the capacitance and we can actually measure the you know to confirm that to the the displacement or force or pressure or acceleration that we need to measure. Uh, they have again profound applications in automotive, smartphones, medical applications, uh, complex structures that are used in accelerometers or can say gyroscopes, and gyroscope, these are accelerometers. So again, uh, other applications could be measuring magnetic field based on Hall effect, magnetoresistors, magnetodiodes, magnetotransistors, can measure temperatures called as, you know, using something called as uh, microthermistors, micro example of a microthermistor at micro level is here. So we have infrared radiation accordingly, this, this change the distance so we can measure it based on some capacitance change and other properties. So micro sensors have also enabled measurement techniques that were previously laboratory based and they have extended into the field of instruments, so spectroscopic instruments and the device to measure viscosity. Uh, this is uh, a typical line diagram of an accelerometer. Uh, so we have a piezo resistor here. We have vibration that is caused to this sensor as an external vibration. And this is the cantilever. This is the proof mass. And this is the substrate that is put up here, a base. And you can have it in this form also where we have sensing capacitors, vibration acts. A C smooth mass is put up there. And then a substrate is there. So in this case, we have an alternative capacity micro accelerometer, which provides a calibrated compressor and amplified output. It has a capacitive silicon microsensor to measure displacement of the proof mass. This is integrated with the signal processing chip. So this is one of the great advantages. So you have the sensor and the signal processing chip. They are protected by a plastic enclosure. So it has a 3D structure. It gives higher measurement sensitivity than the surface machined elements. The limitations obviously are that the output is prone to noise contamination. So you need to make you know signal processing you, know, you can see circuits on the same chip, which obviously makes them smart microsensors. Again, another problem could be that the output is of very low magnitude. So this can this will reduce something or this will need something called a signal amplification, and it may also need something called an analog to digital converter. And so all those things can be even you know put up in the in the in, in, in the sensor. So this is an you can say limitation, you can say additional thing that is required, which, which could be called as the limitations. That's all. Thank you.